Welcome to Pick a Hand, the interview show where I bring on fellow creators and attempt to take their money. How? Through multiple pick your poison scenarios, I ask them the tough questions your local podcast is frankly too poop to ask. The more they walk through the fire, the more chance they have at emptying my own pockets. The pot at the end will always be put towards the creator's charity of choice, so even though I'll burn a bridge, we still end with wholesomeness. For this episode, I brought a man on a mission. The Iceberg King, over a million subs and rolling, the Hawaiian shirt titan himself, Wendy Goon. So please grab yourself a whiteboard and enjoy the interview after we pay some bills. Yeah, we sponsored by Shudder. Movies like no other. Watch some scary shit with your girl while you cuddle. Yeah, we sponsored by Shudder. Thrillers and suspense. The Netflix for horror. It's a streaming service. I mean, ain't that shit just obvious? Watch classics so ominous. I review a few of these shocking flicks. I mean, you know the beyonds of shit. Curse films, that's a poppin' pick. Talking about the exorcist and all the cursed background. Original movies every week. That's a fact now. Shudder.com. Use code Mr. G. 30 days free. Man, I'll make it look easy. S H U D D E R. Gotta spell it out, cause they tell me spelling's hard. And thank you, Shudder, for sponsoring this video. And thank you, Shudder, for sponsoring this video. Now, back to the video. Hello, Wendy Goon. How are you doing? Welcome to Pick a Hand. Hey, man. I am uh, excited to be on. This show looks fantastic. I've watched every episode, and I was kind of subtly to the side. Hopefully, you'd invite me on eventually. And now we're here, so I'm pumped. I can't wait. All right. I love it. I'm glad you actually want to be on this show. <laughs> we, can, uh, we can just jump straight into it here with question one. Oh, boy. Here we go. All right. Just, just right into the hot zone. Okay. All right. I'm good. I'm good. I, I watched the episodes. I'm warmed up. Let's go. <laughs> oh, okay. Here we go. You have skyrocketed on YouTube, right? And I might be crazy, but I don't think I see you going back to washing dishes at a steakhouse anytime soon. <laughs> uh, you're a YouTuber, right? Right. You're a YouTuber yeah. and that's great. However, for a multitude of reasons, I don't tell every Joe Schmo in my life that that's my job. So I wonder, Wendy Goon's at the dentist or he's with a gathering of folks maybe you're not too familiar with. What do you tell people you do? And if you tell them YouTube, What's the follow-up response to, oh, what do you make videos about? What I say depends on who I'm around. If it's around someone who I like see a couple times a year and I just kind of know them by name and they ask what I do, I'll normally say like, oh, I work online and that's vague enough that they don't ask any more questions or maybe they're afraid to. <laughs> if it's some, if it's like a family member or someone who I actually want to know, I will say I make YouTube videos. And then that's the follow-up question they have is where it gets weird. Because one time I said that to someone, there's a gun shop I frequent in town, someone who was in the gun shop who I've seen around a few times. I was like, oh, I do YouTube. He goes, oh, that's cool. What do you make in a year? Like just <laughs> out of the gate, first <laughs> question. I was like, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> and a few people, I think it's interesting because a lot of people have that question about YouTubers because a lot of people still yeah. see it as a farce. So about half the time I'll get something kind of related to money, but if it's like a family or friend, then they ask the question of, oh, what kind of videos do you make? And that's where it gets complicated with me <laughs> because you can't just meet like your grandma and be like, oh, well, have you ever heard of Mondo films? And like go into that whole conversation <laughs> with them. Normally the, the way I've like, figured out to describe it through trial and error is that I make videos about internet campfire stories. Um, hmm. Whether they be weird things from history or weird conspiracy theories or what have you. And that does enough to satisfy people and kind of explains what I do. So I kind of like every time someone asks what I do, I enter this like yes or no line of river questioning <laughs> like what uh, what trial i go down so it just depends on the person if i really know them i say i make internet campfire stories but like i said if i don't i just work online and that does it so so you just basically find like what stop are you getting off at you know pretty much do i yeah. do i want to leave the door open for more questions past this probably not so yeah this yeah is where we stop it exactly also exactly. uh let me see your wallet and thank you <laughs> I did have so a, well, I did have one guy. He's a friend of mine who's um, he was a Vietnam vet, so he's an older guy. And uh, he knew I made YouTube videos, and I talked to him a couple times. And then, like four or five times after seeing him, after I told him about YouTube, he was like, "So, do you like draw an employment?" And I'm like, I kind of stared at him for a second. I'm like, "I make money off of YouTube." He goes, "Oh, 
that's a thing you can do and like so there is definitely a gap between like you know people who are in it and uh, like the older generations who don't get that it is like you know a business so to speak like you said kind of pretty much what stop are you getting off at depends on what i say to people yeah no that makes perfect sense i felt like it's always been like quasi disrespectful when someone asks like oh do you make money off it yeah but it's like i get just some people just don't understand yep. right and yep. they need to yep. like legitimize it in their head totally get it yeah okay yeah. now moving on to question two all right wendy goon you had an interesting take through your serial killer iceberg Oof. you talked about how uh, if we as a collective <laughs> do not want to glorify serial killers then why do we give them cool nicknames like jack the Ripper? I, I, I think, right? I think you got me worried <laughs> when you said you had don't to, worry okay all right all right it's um, calm and cool i'm holding your hand here we're okay, I, I okay? Appreciate, thank you don't Gigi. <laughs> I, I know uh i know your on the spot solution to that specifically was giving them dorky names like stupid baby man right but with yeah. the media's craving for spicy headlines that's probably not plausible right, right so is there a realistic alternative there or should this even really be considered a problem i don't know if it's so much a problem with the historical aspect of it and maybe a little bit but where i see it as being more of a problem is in like modern media coverage whenever you have cases like that i remember i think it was two or three years ago there was a serial killing out west i want to say nevada somewhere out west and they immediately started to market this guy as the next night stalker and like the the language around it was weird it wasn't this was a monster who like ruined families it was like he prays through the night and stealthily climbs and it's like they were describing a kind of weird anti-hero and I, i've always kind of hated that attitude of it and like i said stupid baby man in the video as you know obviously for comedic effect to push the point yeah. too far however i do think the idea of elevating the worst of society into a place of infamy is a bad idea at least as we current deal with stuff like for example you and i are on the same page where we see so many weird accounts and people fangirling over people like ted bundy and we're, mm -hmm. we're not going to be able to stop that <laughs> anytime yeah, soon. No. <laughs> um, but what we can do is like moving forward, stop treating it like anything more than just a monster doing terrible things. Because I've, like with that specific one, the new Night Stalker, there were people talking about how attractive he was and other gross stuff like that. So in short, without going into a whole spiel about it, there are a mm. lot of people who are depressed or they don't have anything to cling on to for one reason or another. And a lot of the time, that's how people get radicalized into certain groups or the other they don't have anything to lead them so they grab onto the first thing that looks like it has some kind of incentive so whenever you take someone who has nothing and then they start to see people get thrown over the news with all this attention and admiration it doesn't really matter what it is they're just looking for something and that's most often where glory killings or things like that come from uh, it's very similar to like the school shooters who uh historically in their videos where they talk about why they did it they echo the same sentiments again not stupid baby man maybe a little far but I think people could be more um, diligent with the way they handle information about evil people. That's the only point I'm trying to get across, so. It was one of those weird things that I never really thought about when you brought it up, but it was like, I mean, when I think of Jack of the Ripper, I think almost like a, like a fucking DC yep. character. Yeah, yeah. You know, this real like slick guy that got away, evaded justice, but like he's a fucking terrible, terrible person. He killed yeah. six pregnant women. And I think it was like within the year they had comics printed of him in the newspaper of like this devilish figure stalking through the night. So this goes way back. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like it's, it's not just a new thing that's happened where we kind of glorify and i think the reason f we do that is because anytime something is different or outside of the norm we give attention to it and talk about why it's interesting uh but with cases like that it's probably better if we don't glorify that aspect of it just give it bare bones exactly Guy yeah. slays six pregnant women yes yeah. terrible fucking headline exactly that uh, much that like if that was the title for it and not jack the ripper praise the streets of london i feel like there'd be a lot less comic books and fangirls for it well this is, <laughs> it seems like a like a weirdly dark intro i haven't even gotten to pick an yet this is... <laughs> every time we do this it starts on the worst note <laughs> all right well, oh, we'll, we'll find we'll find some lightheartedness here yeah 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 maybe we, not we're here <laughs> because we have arrived at our first pick a hand well, oh, it doesn't boy, matter what right. hand you pick because you're still gonna get punched in the face i will give you one word as a hint to each hand's question but that will be it and yes the picket hand questions will get a bit more saucy each time we come back around so wendy goon in my left we will talk suggestions in my right we will talk quantity 
Wendy Goon? Pick a hand. Ooh, vague. I like it. Um, I'm going to start off, because I have no idea what it's related to, with quantity. <laughs> you have chosen the right hand of quantity. Wendy Goon. <clears throat> I've personally had a rather slow intro to 2022. I've posted seven videos totaling a little over two hours of content, right? And I'm, I bring that up as a very loose base number. You, on the other hand, have posted 14 <laughs> videos totaling around 14 hours of content. Have you already run into burnout at all? Or do you fear it's on the horizon? Or are you just running on the adrenaline of this absolute terrier on <laughs> I appreciate that. Don't sell yourself short. I, I know from some of your features and stuff, you've got stuff on the way. <laughs> <laughs> but, wow, I haven't heard anyone quantified as 14 hours for 14 videos. So that took a second to process. Yeah, <laughs> um, <that's> factual. <laughs> <laughs> the difference between, like, me and, like, you is your videos are very thought out, well edited, and structured, whereas mine are more along the lines of just crazy ramblings. My editing is much more minimal. And like, whereas I couldn't do 14 videos as well as you do them, if that makes sense. Because like mine is much more just talking long form. Now, I absolutely love doing that. I love being able to just ramble into a camera and I'm glad that people have come to expect a low level of effort from me <laughs> as far as that's concerned. <laughs> However, as far as burnout goes, the closest thing I've ever had to burnout is wanting to change topics for a little bit. Like if I cover a lot of internet horror, I want to cover a real life history. If I cover a lot of real life history, I want to cover a conspiracy theory or whatever. And it's mm -hmm. just jumping from topic to topic. So I haven't really had burnout because every time that I feel I may be getting a little tired of what I'm doing, I'm excited to get into the next kind of topic and eventually circle back to that. And something that I'm really happy with is I think I've set up the channel in a way that I can do weird stuff like that and it's not out of the ordinary. Like if right now I decided I found some random weird web archive on YouTube and just wanted to make a whole series about it, that's something that my audience would come to expect, I think. And uh, I'm very blessed to have that opportunity. But uh, no, I'm, I'm very thrilled with where I'm at and you know, thrilled to see where it goes from here. Well, that's good news as a fellow creator. That's awesome. Cause it's not like I wanted you to be like, yeah, no, honestly, this fucking <laughs> sucks, dude. It's been fucking rough, man. No, okay, that's good news. That's awesome. After after um, that serial killer answer, I needed to give you a prank on that. <laughs> you have answered that. And uh, as, as we do here on Pick a Hand, that is $50 out of my own pocket. Thrown into the pot, which we will discuss at the end of the video. Now you have a choice, Wendy Goon. You can now take that W and just move on with the interview as regularly scheduled. Or you can move to the left hand, which is suggestions. However, if you move to this hand, you have to answer this question. You cannot buy your way out of it as you could with the first question. Wendy Goon, what do you want to do? See, I, li I like this, the way this game's structured, because there's no profit or like real incentive to pick it other than just like being a man. And I'm gonna be a man. I'm gonna take I'm gonna take that hand. Let's go to suggestions. <laughs> okay, you have chosen the left hand. Suggestions. You cannot buy your way out of this. Here we go. I don't think you'll need to. I'm sure at this point you get bombarded with uh, iceberg suggestions and this type of thing is inevitable. So don't take offense, guys. Uh, what are some of the stupidest iceberg <laughs> suggestions you've gotten? <laughs> I'm, no, literally no one's asked about this before, and it's one of the things I wanted to talk about the most. Here so, you go, go crazy. The, the funniest thing to me, it, like, obviously, I get a bunch of iceberg suggestions that I won't do because they're, like, other conspiracy theory icebergs or other disturbing movie icebergs. And I've already done that. I don't want to go over them again. But the funny ones to me are the super niche topic icebergs I get sent. I remember someone sent me a mold iceberg, like, different kinds of molds that can grow in houses and basements <laughs> and they were like ranked by danger level i guess <laughs> and they just wanted me to break down all the different kinds of mold? molds <laughs> yeah just different kinds of molds you could find in your house um <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes i'll see a very niche one that i think would be cool like for example i've wanted to do longer historical videos about eras in history and someone sent me a roman leader iceberg of like you know the different famous leaders of rome and while i wouldn't do an iceberg on that it did give me the idea of like maybe doing a video about the history of rome 
like briefly explained would be pretty cool. I got sent a cheese iceberg. I remember that one. It was different kinds of cheeses. And ah oh man, there was one. Wait, how are the cheeses ranked? I don't understand. It was like, where, where does provolone sit on that? Uh, I think that would have been by? like, like uh, just below the top. I think they were ranked by obscurity because I recognized that the top was like, you know, craft single or whatever. Then at the bottom, <laughs> it was just Italian words I never heard of before. <laughs> so okay. I imagine if, if it is by obscurity, it got me the lower tiers were unknown uh -huh. um and then there was a real oh I remember, it was a cryptid iceberg i got sent but it was by level of bangability so like oh okay. the, 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 <laughs> And, the, and the, the message they sent with me, it's like, I think this would be a fun little twist on the uh, cryptid iceberg. You could talk about how, like, attractive they are. And I'm like, you know I'm a Sunday school teacher, right? <laughs> I love how they just, they just devolve into it. Fun little twist. <laughs> just talk about fucking them, too. Yeah, give me the history, yeah. But, like, crevices? Thoughts? <laughs> So <laughs> I know what could set you apart from everyone else. Yeah, <laughs> they're fun. Like, obviously, I'm not going to do something like that, but I love getting those DMs. They're fantastic. That's awesome. See, easy enough. Yeah, perfect. Another $50 I'm... in the pot out of my wallet. It's $100 you already gathered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very let's good. go. Nice, nice. Next question here. Um, you used to be very much into lucid dreaming as far as I can Ooh. see, right? Yep. yep. And uh, given your experience, you said to leave a lucid dream, you had to fall over. Is that correct? Yes, correct. Yeah. I find lucid dreaming to be fascinating. So I'm s sorry, small tangent here. Oh, you're fine. With a handful of lucid dreams that I've had where the dream is taking a negative turn into nightmare territory, I would always try and find something to jump off of, that hoping the landing would end the dream, right? Which worked until it didn't. Mm. My theory is that I started to think during the jump, man, it'd be scary as shit if this jump actually didn't wake me up and I stayed here. And I think that mere thought that settled out because I was lucid dreaming began to overpower this surefire escape that I had. And essentially my brain fucked my brain over. Your thoughts on that? Um, so I think you're absolutely right. The reason that I've always said that falling is a surefire way out is because the way I used to do it, because I, I was in a period where I lucid dreamed like nearly every night for months on end. I just got really good to stay in the cycle of it. And the way I would always wake myself up is I'd just go, I'm going to wake up now. And I would wake up. And then one night I thought a thought to myself along the lines of, man, it'd be real weird if I couldn't wake up. And that... It, it quit working. <laughs> and, yeah. and I think it's the exact same way uh, that the fall not working was for you. Because yeah. after that, every time I did it, I would just like push myself over. And thankfully, I never had the idea you had of what if this doesn't work as I was going down. <laughs> Whenever you start to panic or stress, your brain begins to panic and stress. So it starts to fill in the gaps of your visual, you know, sensory with things that would make you panic or stress, which is where the dreams get way, way worse. And like I said, falling was always a surefire to me because I never had that thought, but thank you for ruining that. Uh <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm yeah. so sorry. <laughs> I, I guess I got to figure out a new one. But really what you just said, well, this makes it more complicated. I thought that what had happened is the whole, oh, wouldn't it be scary if I didn't wake up just applied to the whole I want to wake up now strategy. But since you pointed out that it doesn't, that it does the same thing to falling, then really no strategy safe now that I think about it because you can just talk your way out of it. It's your thoughts going at each other the same way you can kind of control your dream as is with your thoughts. Well, you can also fuck yourself and keep yourself there because it's like, damn, this must suck if I stay here for eternity. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just can't leave your own head. I don't know. It's it's stressful. <laughs> this this goes back to my thesis. Don't try a lucid dream. <laughs> you know, like unless you're yeah. like really ready and in a sound mind, don't try it. I've had more bad experiences than I have good ones. I'd say the thing that happened to you was the same thing that happened to me only yours is way worse because it means that it, it'll go anywhere <laughs> take the wise words guys uh don't lucid dream or responsibly lucid dream <laughs> your call <laughs> moving on to the next question here when i was barely getting familiar with your content you seem to be very well known for your iceberg videos and conspiracy theories but some of my favorite videos from you are when you become this obscure history buff you know from archduke ferdinand to the franklin expedition i'm hooked on that shit cool nice and and uh i know the very ambitious eight hour world war ii video is <laughs> to be determined right but if you could humor us with a few for lack of a better term fun facts 
regarding World War II that just are always in your head, I'd love to hear them. I really appreciate that. I'm glad you like the weird history stuff because I love weird history. And for uh, you and anyone else who may be watching this who knows my channel, the eight hour World War II video, I am currently setting up with people so that I can actually go and view things and like uh, have like visual representations for the stuff I'm talking about. So it is in the works. Mm. Um, World War II is probably the most ripe time in human history for conspiracies. The idea of like military intelligence was coming into fruition for what we know now and the first espionage games began to take place. I'm going to have some of the facts wrong when I say this okay. because I don't have it like, you know, I don't have all the research done and written out. But one of my favorite things that relate to the idea of how weird espionage was is there was a body found on the shores of France, I believe, that was supposedly a German spy. And the body was brought back to Britain and he had handcuffed to his arm a briefcase that had plans for a German sneak attack of Britain or what have you. So Britain finds this dead German spy and he's got all this information saying they're going to attack Britain and Britain decides to fortify their defenses or go attack. I forget the exact, you know, cause that this had within the war, but whatever it was, it caused Britain to uh, attack Germany at a different angle and arguably to some help Britain win the war. It turns out years later that that was not a German spy. And as a matter of fact, if I remember correct, it was just a random Portuguese guy who had died and I think it was the French staged his body to look like it was a German spy with information because France wanted Britain to help them out to fortify some beach or what have you. So that was an ally tricking another ally by making them think that Germany had a sneak attack when a sneak attack never existed in the first place. There's a lot of weird stories of like German U-boats sighting ocean monsters. There's of course all the conspiracies about Hitler surviving World War II and making his way to South America. World War II is very ripe for a lot of the weird and I'm very excited to talk about it. To the degree that right now I'm kind of having to like save myself from making a bunch of weird weird videos about it. Something else, I, I was a nerd, if you couldn't tell, uh, in like middle school and high school. And I was always fascinated with history. And a lot of people find history really lame. And that's because the way that like educational history is set up is they like, okay, remember this name, remember this date, and that's it. But whenever you think about these historical events as like people who had their own motives and reasons for doing what they're doing, who did all of these grand events throughout history, it becomes such an interesting story. And one of the things I try to do with videos like the Franklin Expedition and stuff like that is get that drive back to remember like the human experience as a whole because i think it's really interesting yeah i think you really touched on that i'm gonna butcher the fucking name the uss indianapolis yes yeah that's man. correct yeah that's it that's yeah, it you, you got it you touched on that at the end and i think that was a really nice way to tie that entire story up yeah like uh there, there's a lot of tragedies like that that are otherwise forgotten uh, i remember watching an interview i think it was with a world war one soldier and he was describing how uh, chemical gas was used in the trenches and pretty much to my knowledge nearly everyone who fought in world war one is now passed that was over a hundred years ago at this point and this was an interview in like the early 2000s or late 90s and he ended the interview by saying but i guess in the end it won't matter because give it another few years and everyone who was there that day will be dead and that was such like a heartbreaking uh idea to me that someone who endured all these tragedies and conquests has now come to a point in his life where it doesn't matter on the grand scheme of things so when I tell stories about the Indianapolis stuff like that I hope at least to a few more people that it still matters because it does to me and I think that's a very honorable thing for you to do and I think uh, that, that you definitely relate that thank you thank you well I think that's a good time for us to go to our next pick of hand here <laughs> so uh, Wendy Goon you, you know you know the jig you know what goes on here in my left we will talk music in my right we will talk corporate and one of these is a two-parter by the way I know I spoil you Wendy Goon Pick a hand. Oh, man. I have no idea where either of these could go. I'm so enthralled <laughs> the mystique. <laughs> Let's start with the music. Let's see where that goes. Okay. Music. So, you will often showcase uh, a vinyl uh, you're a fan of in your background, right? And one of them being Astroworld by Travis Scott, mm. who which at one point last year was a tough artist to publicly support. What's your right. opinion on separating the art from the artist? Mm, oh boy. All right. There are several cases, not just of with like Astro World. Man, that's a good question. Uh, there are several <laughs> cases, not just with Astro World, where uh, someone can make an incredible work and the impact that work had is not reliant on the artist expression or how they exist or what, what or even what they mean by it in a lot of cases. An example of that, 
is I think Rosemary's Baby is one of the scariest and best horror films of all time. Uh, just like the way of shot and the tension everything's great but the director Roman Polanski is still hiding in Europe because he's facing a uh child endangerment charges or essentially pedophilia charges there were so many people who were inspired by rosemary's baby to go for it i think i may be wrong here but i think james wan said that was the movie that got him into horror so is it because roman polanski's a bad guy james wan has illegitimate reasons to be a director or perhaps someone can make something greater than themselves or in the case of Polanski in spite of themselves. I think a lot of the trap that like I'm on the conspiracy theorist side of the internet and mm -hmm. there's a ton of people who like l just had a field day with that Astro World stuff and it it was like malarkey. Everyone wants the bit the bad guy, the conspiracy bad guy to just be like a big devil horns and very obvious that it's an evil situation but that's never how it goes. Yeah. Um but the majority of what happened there was negligence and just stupidity on the part of um, you know himself and the others around it and the reason that I put the Travis Scott vinyl in the background for pretty much the entire beginning of my YouTube videos is whenever that album came out I was in high school and my friend and I were really big fans of like rap and hip hop and all that. And the night it came out, he came over to my house and we like, we did the works. We set up a stereo system. We had like LED lights hooked up to it and everything. We're like, we're gonna listen to this uh, album from start to finish. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the coolest music experiences I ever had of just listening to the music and going through it. So as James, like obviously I'm not James Wan or anything. If he was not illegitimized by what Roman Polanski did, then I am not not illegitimized by what Travis Scott did. That album is still an experience I had and an experience I shared with a friend. And that's the reason that was up there. Not because I think Travis Scott's a swell guy. So I think like the album still stands and the music still stands in spite if he's a dumb guy, essentially. Okay, interesting way to put it. I've never really heard it quite like that. Perfect, <laughs> yeah, that's a great fucking answer. Thank you. This was a two-parter, by the way. Oh, okay. All right, Music cool. made me think of something else as well. Your girlfriend, Kayla, used to be a really big Lil Dicky fan. But with his TV show, Dave, that seemed to very much <laughs> delay an album. And at, at this point, it's been nearly seven years since he has dropped another album. In my world, that makes me think of a YouTuber who moves to more traditional media, abandoning their channel for the most part, right? right. What do you think about the YouTubers who have taken that path? And is that something you might be interested in? Ooh. Ooh, ooh, that's a that's a good question, man. That, ooh, you you spun a yarn on that one. I like that. <laughs> There's a difference between stepping into new avenues and abandoning your fans or abandoning the people who got you to that point. An example of how not to do it, in my opinion, is like you're saying with uh, Lil Dicky, where he's like making music and then like, I will now quit music and begin TV show. Whereas I watched a YouTube doc the other day about Joji and how he transitioned from like complete opposites from Filthy Frank into like lo-fi hip hop. He's done phenomenal at it. He's done a great job. And they showed how throughout his career, he laid the seeds for what he wanted to do at the same time that he began his transition. So no one was ever thrown off by a breakneck turn. It was just kind of a slow move into it. And if people mm -hmm. wanted to leave, they could. Uh, if they wanted to stay, they could, but they were never kicked off the bus, essentially. And in a way, it's kind of like, as a you know, normal YouTuber, just transitioning your content to a degree. I got kind of pigeonholed in the beginning, and perhaps I still am to some, as kind of like the iceberg YouTuber, because I covered a lot of icebergs in the beginning. So what I decided to do is I would continue doing icebergs because people like them, but I was going to do two other videos in between every iceberg video. That way I'm not stuck. And if people like the new content, they can like it. And if they don't, I'll still be doing icebergs for now. And as that path went, I haven't done an iceberg in forever now, but people still enjoy the content because I didn't make them feel like they were wrong for enjoying the old content. And that kind of scales up. Like right now, it, it's official now. I can say it on podcast or whatever. I am helping Evan Royalty uh, write his next uh, short film. He's the guy who did the SCP movies, which are pretty big on YouTube, and he's doing a stalker movie, and I'm helping him write that. My plan is not, if this goes well, to just quit my YouTube channel and then start into writing. I planned whatever way the transition be, if that does build up, to continue to make content and make sure no one gets left behind just because a new avenue opened up for me. There's a right way and a wrong way to do it. I want to continue to do it the right way, if that makes sense. That's a res respectable answer. You don't have to just jump ship and be like, well, see you guys who wanted to see this. Yeah. We're on to the next one, baby. <laughs> oh, you like icebergs? Loser. <laughs> <laughs> that is 
50 bucks thrown into yeah, the pot let's go, let's for go. you answering that question. You once again have the choice to ignore the other hand and move on with the interview, or you can jump to the other one, which was once again, corporate. Oh, you, you already know what I'm gonna do. I'm, I'm not gonna let a question be unasked. Let's go to corporate. All right, he's gonna be a man, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, he's gonna be a go. man. All right. Right hand, corporate. Having such a quick trajectory on YouTube is an incredible thing, but I don't know if that's true in regards to sponsorships. Let me explain. I consider there to be tiers of sponsorships, right? So when you're launched into stardom, you might skip the playground of shit tier mobile games and go toe to toe with corporate giants with no experience with these little scrubs on the bottom, right? That were <laughs> helping you out along the way. In addition, with your sub count skyrocketing, your value as a creator is constantly changing. And that's not only hard to manage for yourself, but it's also hard to relay to sponsors. Mm. I say all that with the bold assumption that you have been fucked by one sponsor or another through your <laughs> climb. Is that true, Wendy Goon? Um, I wouldn't say that they did me dirty. Mm -hmm. More so, there is an exception that sometimes I can't always meet. Where I am climbing very quickly, and I'm very blessed and thankful to everyone for the opportunity I've had to be at this point. Well, my advertising agent was trying to like pin me down on a price point to like, you know, offer to agencies, but it changes every few weeks. And because of that, the values keep changing and what have you. That's twofold. So on one hand, if someone wants to offer me a long-term contract, I usually can't take it because I know those values aren't going to be good long-term and I don't want to book up something long-term. But on the other hand, something that's happened recently is I'm kind of overestimated. And what I mean by that, but one of the brands offered me, you know, a relatively large sum of money to do a video because they saw how fast I was climbing. So I do that ad for them. And then the information I got back essentially was this is not within the lines of what your projected growth was supposed to be. And they weren't mad, they weren't jerks about it or whatever. They were just saying that because whenever they offered to do it the next month, it was lower than what the original one was. Because I guess what had happened is they saw me climbing up really fast and like pretended to give me an amount that would have been up there, you know, where the climb was supposed to be going. Yeah. But the video didn't do that well so then that was the first time i had an advertiser step back afterwards and that was interesting that was the first time i've been overshot and things like that have happened a couple times since well obviously i'm not trying to say this to sound you know complaining or upset about the success by any means mm -hmm. but <laughs> i saw that face um, <laughs> but it is an interesting dynamic because while most people just kind of assume that everyone else is playing catch up to me in cases like that i have to play catch up to what's expected of me if that makes sense that's odd i did not yes, think that yeah, would be that, your I, like i've talked i've talked to other people in similar scenarios and they haven't had an experience like that i think that's fairly unique yeah i was about to say i i've never heard of that and i also would blame that company entirely for being <laughs> that, that was that was your guesstimate that's cool this is what it is baby <laughs> and like like i said they were not jerks about it at all they were just saying that to justify why they stepped back in the next offer but i remember hearing that being like oh now I'm the one on the front foot. You didn't gain 100k subscribers last month? <laughs> Get back to work! Come on! <laughs> Yeah, no, I, like, oh, well, oh, so now you stop conveniently. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, that's, I, that's weird. All right, well, uh, that's another 50 bucks thrown in the pot on my yeah, behalf. Total of 200 yeah. so far. You are doing incredible, Wendy Goon. We are going to move on to the next question here. Do you know, Wendy Goon, which your most viewed video is off the top of your head? It would be the disturbing movie Iceberg. It very much is the disturbing movie Iceberg at 6.3 million views walking insane by the way but it's your number one <laughs> most viewed video so i appreciate that i i have a theory not exactly a hot take but i think a season creator's most viewed video will never be the creator's actual favorite video of theirs right and unless you've had a change of heart regarding the black parade this does apply to you right but <laughs> but, but but overall do you agree disagree why yes okay so man you are these questions are like I like them. All right. So um, 
I think it's possible for, depending on the kind of content you make, that your most viewed video can be uh, your favorite. Like some people, uh, you know, honestly have to do YouTube as a job. And, you know, for them, it would make sense that the thing they had the most success in is going to be the one that is their favorite. And there's, you know, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that by any means. However, for me, I make a lot of the content because I love to make it. And you referencing the Black Parade video is interesting because I still would say that's one of my favorite videos because it's something that I feel was I guess the most original. And even though putting a story for the Black Parade isn't original, it was something that I came up with on my own before I really stepped into the content creation scene. So it felt like a fulfillment to me to get to that point. The disturbing movie Iceberg, the reason that I feel it did so well is because it I just accidentally hit the nail at the right point of time because there was a spark of interest and like disturbing movies started up. Uh, the Iceberg trend was just starting up and like those two things just combined at once. And uh, that was very monumental growth for my channel. As a matter of fact, a YouTuber by the name of Mr. Gigi uh, gave me a shout out when that happened and that was my first shout out I ever had on YouTube. It's fucking so things like that I, I feel like I just hit at the right time for it but it's not my favorite video because it's something I was interested in but it wasn't something that was deeply personal to me so like my favorite videos would be the Black Parade one, the No Country for Old Men analysis which is the videos on my channel no one watches and honestly my Martin Luther King conspiracy video because that was the one that I sat down and rewatched the whole thing and it just felt like I hit it right. A lot of the times you probably feel the same way. Like you'll look at a video when you're done I think, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty close. Like this came out of the wash the right way, but that MLK one was one when it was over. I was like, I hit the nail on the head. I guess I'm the most proud of. I think the reason for that is everyone has different tastes and enjoyments and mine are no country for old men movie analysis. Uh, emo mid 2000s rock albums <laughs> and yeah. stuff that's hyper specific to me but the stuff that does well is kind of the more broad reaching like icebergs and disturbing movies uh, mm. that everyone can hop in on and I think because of that I would also stretch to say that the disturbing movie iceberg is probably not most of my viewers favorite video of mine even though it's the most watched for the same you, you get what I'm saying for the same reason it's not my favorite because I have specific interest, I probably covered something else that was more of a specific interest for them. It just more so broadly appeals to everyone. Like if I had to rank it this way, every more people liked the disturbing movie I sport than people loved the MLK assassination. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense, yeah. That, that it more widely appeals at an okay level rather than greatly appealing to some. So some of my videos greatly appeal to me, but stuff like Disturbing Movie Iceberg widely appeals to the likes of a lot. And I think that's probably the reason most creators most watch videos not their favorite. Let me turn this back around. I know I'm the one being interviewed, but I want to turn this back around. Right? Yeah, yeah, now you're put, in the Put the gun seat. down, man. Put the gun down. Relax. <laughs> what is your current most watched video? Uh, I believe it's a, it's a movie review of The Hatred, I think, if it's, if that still stands. And is that your favorite video? No. And, uh, yeah, yeah. What What is your favorite video? Tough. Tough call out. And um, man, I want to say it's my dating scam video. That is the first mm. one that comes to mind. I, I put so much into that. It's like, this was this was beautiful to me. It's the first time I ever put together a project like that. And I was just, uh, I was so like pr just proud of it. And I think I still am, it hasn't changed. And I, I think like, and I really like that dating scam video by the way too, but I think that falls in the same line of, you know how much effort went into that and you were proud of the final project. It doesn't necessarily mean it was the most widely appealing video, yeah. but you're happy with what you did. And I think that applies to most creators. Yes, yeah, I very, I very much agree with that. So, Wendy Goon, uh, moving on to the next question here, good sir. Very cool. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't at least once during this interview say the word giants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, you do watch my videos, yeah. all right. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't have a question for it, guys. I'm sorry. I already know why you like them, so I'm not going to ask you and have you belabor the obvious here. So instead... <laughs> <laughs> that was great that you just said it anyway yeah, just needed Very to cool. throw it out there for the clip <laughs> <laughs> so instead what's one thing you miss from writing short horror stories on instagram whoa okay. <laughs> man you you trip me up with the giants and then just like hard cut in <laughs> so i've always loved 
writing horror stories and as YouTube's continue to grow, I haven't been able to do that as much. The stuff I used to write was very short and minimalistic. Normally what I do is I would just find a creepy image or like honestly like deviant artwork people did of like a creepy forest or something. And I would put a short like three paragraph narrative for that image. There's such a simplicity to that that I think is the part I probably miss the most. Obviously I'm, you know, more happy to be where I am now than where I was then, but it was something so, I guess, grounded for me to just see a creepy image and then come up in my head with whatever the story or relic behind it could be and then talk about it and that was it. And th then I just move on to a new project. I think in a way I still do the same thing with my videos where I see something that interests me and I dive into it and then I do the research and I, I wanna make it something that's interesting to everyone else. So in a way, like artistically, I feel I'm kind of doing the same thing in a longer gas, but there was something about writing a narrative uh, not just researching, not just relaying a narrative, but being the storyteller that mm. I kind of miss to a degree. And with things like writing for uh, the Stalker movie that Evan Royalty is working on, that I'm kind of bringing that back to a degree, like creating a narrative or talking within a narrative. People have asked me before, like, you're doing YouTube now, where do you see yourself like down the road? I love YouTube, I don't really see a reason I'd ever leave the platform. But if I could change one thing about myself in that platform, it would not just be creating, not just relaying narratives, it would be creating narratives and telling stories. And that's probably the part I miss most about the short horror stories, but I have a feeling I'll come back to that in one way or the other. Are you still working on your novel related to the supernatural? <laughs> uh, yes and no. So I'm still working on it. I guess the way that anyone who says they have a novel <laughs> is still working on the novel. <laughs> yeah. um, where you add to it and you continuously ideas, you know, everyone's got the notes section in your phone that you kind of like, you know, word vomit onto and then type out later. Mm -hmm. I used to set down and I actually have a typewriter at my house because I like something being so grounded about that. And uh, I used to set down at my typewriter and demand time to work. And now it's just kind of more in the background. But I've always said that before I am dead, I will have a book out and I haven't changed my mind on that. So, yeah. It's a good timeline to work off of. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Just now into forever, somewhere between them. <laughs> Be on the lookout, guys. <laughs> All right, Wendy Goon, we have arrived at our final pick a hand. Toughest of them all, I will warn you. Oh, boy. All right. <laughs> all right. In my left, we will talk virus. In my right, we will talk conspiracy, which are funny words to put together, by the way. But anyway, <laughs> uh, Wendy Goon, pick a hand. Oh boy! All right. So I think we already know at this point. I'm, I'm, I'm doing all the questions. <laughs> okay. So we'll save conspiracy for last. Okay. So I'm gonna save virus for now. All so. right. We're gonna go with virus in my left. Virus. <laughs> okay. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> F follow me through this one, if, if you will. <laughs> I'm ready. I think. Uh, John McAfee, founder of McAfee <laughs> Antivirus. <laughs> I said to follow me here. <laughs> I know. Where, I think I know where this the, is going. All right. J Go John ahead. McAfee, founder of uh, McAfee Antivirus and doer of many other things, was a hefty news topic last June. I won't go further than that, but you had actually publicly announced around that time that you were going to cover the topic and possibly draw a link between him and a man named Jeffrey who owned an island. Uh, you don't you don't have to go into the specifics of that video's current state, but you will often tiptoe around a specific controversial person or topic under the explanation of I, I still want to have a YouTube channel tomorrow, right? <laughs> right so right. why was that McAfee video different? Did something change along the way, or were you just willing to be a YouTube martyr for that story? Interesting. Okay. Okay. That, man, that was that was very funny because when you said virus, I thought we were going the COVID route, and your first words were John McAfee. Yeah, that's, that's why I said to <laughs> that follow. That was good. Me. That was good. I liked it. All right. Um, <laughs> that story has always been like the looming presence, mm -hmm. right? Not just for how crazy and out there of a conspiracy it is, but that was like the thing that just destroyed my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> of the majority of world politics mm -hmm. because it goes from like hey we're worried about this social issue and there's this social issue which are things that like oh i matter i'm glad my you know elected representatives care about it and then like quick side note there's an island in the middle of the ocean but don't worry about that we're gonna keep talking about politics and that it, it was depressing 
uh, at first, especially as I got into research for it. And at the time I didn't have a YouTube channel to talk about, so that was just made me crazy. I think the thing that makes that story different is whereas with things like JFK or MLK, like they're very mainstream, you can talk about them whatever you want. Everyone acts like that event, or at least everyone in power acts like that event never happened. And because of that, you are shaking the table a little bit whenever you start to pull out certain names and certain people who are a member of it. Like when I made my MLK video and I'm talking about, oh, well, there's this member of the police department who took the shot and this one set it up. Like all these guys are dead at this point. It's not like I'm gonna cause any big trouble for him. If someone does get a lot of popularity talking about, you know, the a certain man named Jeffrey who owned an island, it is shaking it up for some people. I don't think it's I'm anyone important enough to get like suicided over it, as some would say. That's never been my concern. It, it is venturing out there. And at the end of the day, I don't know if my YouTube channel would be okay after doing it. And a little bit of that is the enthralling part for me, the part I want to get out. And maybe in like a, a year or two, I, if I was to cover it, it would be with more efficiency and I would know what would happen and whatever. But the other element of it is that a lot of it is still unknown. And I'll actually, can I, can I speak on the John McAfee video for a second? Go nuts. Can I also expose what I had you do for the John McAfee? video <laughs> go ahead i didn't i didn't want to say it it wasn't my place no 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 ahead. no 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 you're fine so i had planned this john mcafee video out uh right after john mcafee committed on a live i got Gigi. I asked various other creators to send in parts for their video, what have you. And Gigi was actually sent me a clip of him talking about uh, what John McAfee did while he was alive. I was geared up, I was ready to make the video, and I started doing research into the letters he was writing from his jail cell and the calls he had made to his wife. And I, I've never told you this, Gigi, but the reason I never made that video is because through research, I've come to the conclusion that I think he did commit suicide and my original purpose of the video was to be like oh look oh look oh yeah john mcafee killed himself or whatever and like connected yeah. back to the whole island owners and all that but then there was like this moment in research where i recognized like man this guy had a lot of issues and i am about to make a video where i make a whole game out of his death and what have you. Not only would it be illegitimate if I continued to pretend like I believed in the whole theory, but it would also be disrespectful for someone who I now believe actually was suffering a lot and did that to themselves. So that's, the John McAfee video is not happening for that reason. In the future, I may make a video about the island owners and what have you, but that was also another big moment for me because I was like so far down this rabbit hole of research and trying to figure out, oh, did he do this? Did John McAfee do this? And then come to the realization that's not really a conspiracy in that sense, it's just a that event. It kind of pumped my brakes a little bit as far as that goes. Uh, something may happen in the future, but I want to make sure I'm not only uh, well informed about it, but also respectful because of situations like that. Yeah, no, and I respect that because I mean, you could have put out a video that would have gotten you millions of views, I'm sure, but <laughs> you, you felt inauthentic and it would have been based on a fucking lie. The good news is 50 more dollars started to the pot. Yeah. You <laughs> Back on the happy question. note. <laughs> yeah. So we got a total of 250 so far. Wendy Goon, of course, you've made it clear how you feel about this, but I'm still going to ask, would you like to go to the right hand of conspiracy or do you want to just go on to the last question? Oh, you, you know what we're doing. We're going to that conspiracy hand. Okay. Let's go. Let's do you it. Yeah. <laughs> Right hand here. <clears throat> Shane Dawson's most viewed video on his channel with over- You keep doing that. You keep doing hey, that. come on. Anyway. This is, this Go is the ahead. fun part about Go it. Ahead. I love it. Go ahead. Shane Dawson's most viewed video on his channel with over 50 million views is titled Conspiracy Theories with Shane Dawson. What are your thoughts on Shane Dawson being YouTube's poster child for conspiracy theories? So, uh, I think I mentioned this- it may have been in an early video or it may have been on a podcast, but in short, Shane Dawson is one of the reasons I started YouTube. And it's for this reason. I've always been weird. I've always been into like weird history stuff and conspiracy theories. And like I said, before I had a YouTube channel, I was like uh, all about the island, you know, happenings and what have you. And the same applies to a lot of the conspiracy theories I talk about now. So esoteric knowledge or supernatural or giants and things like that. I was always super interested in that. And to my mind, that's where conspiracy theories go. And when I started dating my girlfriend, Kayla, uh, I had heard of Shane Dawson. I don't think I ever watched any of his videos. Most of my old YouTube consumption was like Mr. Gigi or uh, like gun channels and stuff like that. So I had actually never seen Shane Dawson. And the first video I saw was my girlfriend. I was like, oh, well you like conspiracy theories. He did a video on conspiracy theories. So I was like, okay, let's watch it. And I remember just 
seething and it's nothing against it was nothing against him as a person i had just met him but he was just saying the most like i typed in conspiracy theory on google and it was the first result the one i i still remember the theory he said that sent me over the edge we were saying they're watching it and i was complaining and then he said that the color yellow is made to catch your attention and in some studies it makes people hungry so perhaps mcdonald's picked the color yellow to catch your attention and make you hungry and i paused the video <laughs> and i looked at her and said this can't be serious this is literally an advertising class this is just how marketing works his conspiracy theory is that a sign is made to catch your attention it i went ballistic mm -hmm. and i was freaking out over it and i looked at this is before i ever started youtube i looked at kayla and said if i ever have a channel i'm going to talk about real conspiracy theories not whatever this is so whenever i started youtube i was like well what do i want to do and i tried some gun videos and didn't really go anywhere with those i tried some like you know movie reviews and i was like what do i want to do and i'm like oh yeah that shane guy <laughs> made that conspiracy video i've got to do one better and that's what got me into the conspiracy theory iceberg which was the initial ignition for my channel so in a weird way i had have to say thank you Shane for giving me that fire in the engine <laughs> to get to where I am because it it infuriated me but I'm here because of it so I can't complain that much <laughs> so uh all Wendy Goon fans props to Shane Dawson whether you like it or not <laughs> you gotta deal with it this is this is who brought you <laughs> Wendy Goon <laughs> Oh no, you put that on I there. Was, uh, so, uh, don't worry, we won't cut it. Uh, I, uh, so, uh, I was curious to see what you thought. I, I, I don't remember seeing those videos so far back and I haven't watched them since. I went to go rewatch them for this question specifically. One of them, he was talking about the live photo function on the iPhone where you can kind of just play it like a GIF and he uh -huh. was freaking the fuck out. And I was like, I, that's just a feature on the iPhone. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't known at that time. I don't know, whatever. That's, that's not the point. Yeah, he, he also, he also that whole thing where it's like, oh, you can hear a phone call seconds before and after yeah. the hang up. It's like, do you know how lines work? <laughs> That's what a phone does. You put creepy music behind anything. You good uh, to go. <laughs> yeah. No hate to Shane Dawson. Just a fun thing to talk about. More of a fun thing to talk about is another $50 stone in the pop, baby. $300. Yeah, let's, go. let's go. On behalf of Shane Dawson. Oh, got a lot of put into there for uh, oh, man. put into there for the pot. So we will have one more question to finish off here. I'm ready. Let's roll. Last question. This one's sweet, short, to the point here. What seems to throw people off the most when they learn it about you? Is it that you're a Sunday school teacher? Is it your extensive knowledge of guns? The fact that you don't curse? The fact that she used to watch the shit ton of Leafy and Pyro Cynical? Or is it the <laughs> fact that you're actually their dad? Interesting. So uh, I've seen all of it, right? I've seen. People people get upset at me for like different various reasons. The Sunday school teacher one is rather reoccurring because I have kind of like the slow continuation on my channel where I talk about Sunday school videos. And let me just say, for the most part, all the comments I get, all the messages I get are overwhelmingly positive about that stuff. I get several from people who are like, I'm not religious at all, but it's really cool to hear you talk about it because most people don't talk about that stuff. But there is a few who get upset by the concept of it. Either they just don't like the concept of it or they were, they have some bad history with people who were religious so that one kind of is always something happening in the background the guns one is oddly less controversial at least has been in my experience mm -hmm. than the christianity thing i think that's because there's been kind of a climate shift in at least american culture it used to just be like guns were seen as like a conservative right-wing southern american thing but now there's been this kind of turn where people have grown a distrust for things like the police and like protect the police and the protectors and what have you and have decided that they need to protect themselves and so like people have quit seeing that as a red flag however they still see christian and again i say they like it's a certain group of people like just various people they still see christianity as being like the standard conservative southern american idea and that's what i've got more flack over over the guns weirdly enough christianity is somehow more southern appalachia than guns now because that makes sense mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but i think the god thing is the one that i've seen the most flack about but i mean as with the god thing and the guns thing that's th there's some things about me that i will not uh change and those are a couple of them so if that puts you off i'm sorry you can go out the same way you came in <laughs> but uh 
I'm, I'm here to continue to be myself and talk about what I want to talk about. And I'm glad that the vast majority of people uh, have supported me through that. And it really does mean a lot. <laughs> very, very, uh, very nice here. It's it's funny. I was gonna I was gonna do a, a game at the end here with you instead of that question where I was gonna have you try and pronounce goofy location names. Uh, <laughs> but I felt I felt like it came off rude, so I pivoted because you're always open. You're always open about like butchering some of the names you have to read because obviously it's just like the most random stuff. But I I've lived in Wisconsin like half my life, and you pronounced Wauwatosa as Wow Wow Tosoa. <laughs> And I was, I paused the video <laughs> and had to rewind. What did he just say? Cause like, I'm pretty sure we're talking about the same thing. And I saw it spelled out. I was like, dude, you added another vowel. What are you doing, Wendy? <laughs> you didn't even try. <laughs> but I, I was you. That didn't end up happening. Bro, no, that, that's, that's hilarious. That's fantastic. So like, I've tried to be better about it now, <laughs> <laughs> but with a lot of the stuff I look over, it is entirely on paper. Like I only read and I pretty much never watch videos over it. So what happens is I get tunnel vision and I write down the names of all these locations and stuff. And at the time I'm like, I'll figure out how to pronounce that later. And then I have my notes and I'm sitting in front of the camera and I look at it. I'm like, hey, here goes nothing. <laughs> wah, wah, toast. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy Goon, that was six pick a hand questions answered. $300 in the pot to donate to a charity of your choice. You ran through this with ease. You gave very specific answers. You depressed me multiple times, but it was all worth it. <laughs> That's like every time we talk to it's each other. Regular though. Wendy so Goon it's, conversation it's at this point. <laughs> if you want to just uh, give yourself a cutesy little shout out here at the end, Wendy Goon, let them know what's up. Uh, I want to say that my channel is Wendy Goon. It's probably in the link or description somewhere. Who I do want to give a shout out to, though, is Mr. GG, because not only does he make fantastic content, but talking to him on and off camera, he is a fantastic guy. He was very helpful to me in starting this channel, not just for giving me a shout out, but giving me advice and i can definitively say i wouldn't be where i am today if it wasn't for him very much appreciate that wendy goon me and shane dawson the dynamic duo baby bringing you to life <laughs> <laughs> <Shoot>. <laughs>it's like three weeks late this was supposed to be out a while ago long story short there's some behind the scenes issues uh that were thankfully kind of fixed up somewhat but uh anyways uh this is not the long project i've been discussing if some of you are curious i still have a very large project on its way it's nearing its end it's very exciting i know fun stuff but if you guys enjoyed this pick a hand episode with wendy goon i would very much appreciate a like uh, pick a hand is a series that i do want to continue no matter what i'm doing on youtube i love to challenge myself to try and deliver a good and proper interview for another youtuber you know they've probably been on countless podcasts where they get the same old questions you know what brought you to youtube what do you think about youtube blah 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 i anytime i see interviews like good interviews like like hot ones interviews or something like that or like nardware stuff i feel like everyone wants to get interviewed because everyone wants to talk about themselves you know it's fun stuff everyone likes to be like in a game show environment type thing i can't get that like sean evans isn't ringing me up right but it's like but i can give i can try and give people that and that's what i want to do with pick a hand and that's why i love doing it and even though it takes long obviously to form the questions and then also blah blah, blah whatever the hell I, I do want to keep doing it and i would love to have many more creators on uh, yeah, if you guys enjoyed this episode, please leave a like. Please subscribe because I have more content coming your way. Uh, shout out to my patrons for always supporting the boy. I am Mr. Gigi, and I am trying to get you more content. I swear I'm not joking. So, uh, as always, I am Mr. Gigi, and I am out. Bye.